I'm going to go ahead and talk about, you know, what should one expect uh, once we've been diagnosed with uh, scoliosis in patients uh, that have uh, cerebral palsy. So the first uh, uh, comment is that it's not uncommon. Anywhere between 20 to 50 percent of patients that have cerebral palsy will develop scoliosis. And there's certain risk factors that we look at or things that may predispose you. And one of the main things is patients that are sitting, that are predominantly sitting in a wheelchair, are much more likely to develop scoliosis. Why does it develop? I mean, you've already heard the term idiopathic used a lot earlier today. We don't quite understand. With patients with cerebral palsy, we have some understanding, probably some sort of a muscular balance. Perhaps it's spasticity. We don't know for sure, but we do know that if you are a sitter, once you start developing scoliosis and you still have a lot of growth left, chances are that that scoliosis is going to progress. And unlike the idiopathic variety that we heard about earlier today, where if you're left with a mild or moderate curvature, 30, 35 degrees, which may not worsen as you get older, patients with cerebral palsy are at risk for progression even as they go into adulthood. So they really need to be watched throughout life for their scoliosis. So what can we do about scoliosis? And of course, you know, we always think of non-operative conservative measurements, uh, measures. And we heard about bracing for idiopathic scoliosis, and Dr. Fletcher is going to educate us further on that. There's a lot of there's literature in that realm for idiopathic scoliosis. Patients with cerebral palsy, it's really you know it's a give or take. It depends on how what the surgeon's perspective is, what the patients and the parents what they're willing for compliance is, and uh, it can certainly have some benefits, potentially delaying uh, progression of a curvature may be able to help children sit better in a wheelchair, but we also have to look at the downsides that, uh, you know, it, it is more difficult to wear because it may interfere with nutrition, it may even interfere with breathing. So again, it's really a decision that's going to be made together with, between the surgeon and, um, and the patient and, and the family. But there's other things we can do. We can go ahead, we can try wheelchair modifications. Lateral supports can be used to help children sit better. And there's several studies that show that although the curve is not controlled through wheelchair modifications, but a child's posture and functional and how they function will improve with uh, even subtle changes. Some of these changes may be lateral trunk supports. You can use a higher back or a firmer back. And again, it is important to note it will not prevent the curve from progressing, but certainly can have a functional impact on, uh, on, our, on, on our children. But there are going to be kids where the curvature is going to continue to progress. And as it progresses, there's several issues that could arise. First of all, if you're sitting and you have a curvature, just the whole sitting balance is going to be thrown off, right? And that is one of the primary uh, areas that we're going to try to treat. That sitting balance can lead to pressure sores and pain. And if we're wearing you know, different braces on our feet, it may affect those as well. And then really, if it gets really far along, it can even affect your lungs and your heart. But a curve really has to get pretty big for that to happen. So, you know, if these curves do continue to progress, you know, when do we consider operating on these children? I can tell you, this is very highly variable. Uh, some surgeons and patients and families may decide, you know, child is still growing, has a 50 degree curvature, we should go ahead and jump in now. Others, I have patients in our practice that may have 80 or 85 degree curvatures where the decision has been made not to operate. And it really is a shared uh, medical, uh, medical decision. I can tell you our study group, which is uh, the research arm of our foundation, when we looked at all the patients in our study group, we found that the average angle for patients that were operated on with patients with cerebral palsy was 80 degrees. I mean, compare that to patients in our study group that have idiopathic scoliosis. It's closer to 50, 52 degrees. So we really have to weigh the pluses and minuses. And one of the main reasons why uh, that difference may exist is that we know that surgery in these patients is going to have a higher rate of complications. The good news is most of these complications we can, we can handle. They're not life-threatening, and we've gotten much better. And a lot of that has come from us being able to study patients with cerebral palsy that have been operated on. So for example, now we put antibiotics into our wound. We understand that we have to give medicines during surgery to really reduce blood loss. So all the uh, efforts that have been put into our study groups have really helped us to change, uh, change our practice. 
But one of the main uh, questions was, we can make an x-ray look pretty, right? You've seen a lot of x-rays, and as surgeons, we're certainly guilty of focusing in on the x-ray. Let's get the child balanced. Let's get the curve straightened. But how is a child really doing functionally, right? And this has really been a main focus of a study led by uh, Dr. Paul Sponseller, where we've really said, you know, let's forget about radiographic outcomes, or like, at least make them secondary. Let's really see how do these children do with respect to their health-related quality of life measures, right? What really matters? Do we improve these children from before to after surgery? Well, the good news is this, these studies are just starting to come out from our, we've been doing this study for the last eight, nine years. We're starting to get data. And what we're finding is, yes, we are making a difference with surgery at two years, at five years. And perhaps really importantly, we've also compared our surgical patients to our non-op patients and found that, yes, it makes a difference. That kids that were operated on, their health-related quality of life scores do improve. So, you know, it's, uh, it, this study that we, that we formulated was a real great opportunity for us to really see how we can all work together, right? We have surgeons, we have caregivers, and the study that Dr. Pat Cahill from our group led was he looked at, you know, what are the top three reasons for each child does the surgeon think would be for, for surgical intervention? But we also asked the child's caregiver, the family member, you know, why are you having this surgery? The good news was we found that the reasons were pretty similar. Sitting balance, worried about lungs, right? Worried about long-term, what are the lungs going to do? And pain. But if you look at it more closely, what you find is, and I want you to just focus in on that circle part, 124 total surgeons, 55 or 43% said pain is one of the major reasons why we're going to operate. Compare that to what you told us. You told us it should actually be higher than that. It should be 75%. So what we did, we said, wait a second, we may, perhaps we need to focus more efforts on this. And Bert Yaze actually led a study. We said, we got to figure this out. If pain is one of the main reasons you're telling us to have surgery, we've got this large data set with almost 300 patients. Why don't we take a look at this? So Dr. Yaze did this study. He looked at pre- and post-operative pain measures. He looked at the VAS score, very commonly obtained. And what he found was that the vast majority of patients actually do show an improvement in their pain. There were only four out of over 100 that actually did not show this improvement. So again, it's a prime example of why we need to get together in this room to really optimize our care. So in summary, children with uh, uh, cerebral palsy are at risk for developing scoliosis, particularly if they're not walking. Sometimes bracing and wheelchair modifications can help provide some control Surgery, only when indicated, can improve the quality of life in these patients, but surgeons and caregivers have to really work together to optimize the care. Thank you.